Good morning. So there's an old saying that says vision leaks. And so the month of September is our opportunity to stop the leaks in our vision, to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we know where um, we're going, what we're doing, kind of uh, make sure that we're, we're all uh, thinking and heading in the, the same direction. Uh, so the month of September, we stop and we talk about uh, who we are and what we believe God is calling us to for the next ministry year. We have found that uh, uh, we need to start out, first of all, with our identity. Our identity is where it all begins, and our identity comes from uh, Matthew chapter 28 that says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. All right, so when you take on someone's name, you take on their identity, and our identity is found in three parts. And it comes from what follows. First of all, we're in the name of the Father who made us his children. And because he made us his children, that means that we are family. We're also baptized in the name of the Son. The Son is our King, the servant King, actually. And so as if he is a servant, we are also servants. So we are sent to be his servants. And then the Holy Spirit, we're baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, who empowers and equips us and sends us out to make disciples of all nations. He's empowered us to be missionaries. So in our new identity, we are to make disciples of others so they also can take on this identity. But what is a disciple? And how do we make disciples? Well, the verse also tells us what that means. It says, by teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And that is, he's commanded us to go and make disciples. And so all of it, and that comes out through the teachings of Jesus. So a disciple then is someone who's trying to live in obedience to the teachings of Jesus. And at the beacon, we summarize these teachings, summarize this passage in our identity in the statement that says, we are a family of missionary servants sent as disciples to make disciples. And we've given each of those pieces of our identity an icon uh, to each of those elements. And family, that's the blue one there, families gather. And you'll see the little people in the icon that looks like people gathering around a table. We'll talk about that later. Which table do we gather around? Uh, missionaries go, and that's the orange because we're in the city of orange. And there's an arrow that says go. And then the disciples grow to be more like Jesus. That's the green growing leaf there. And servants give of our time, talents, and treasures, all that God has gifted us. We give those things back to Jesus and to others uh, as an act of worship. So that is what we do, but then the next question is the when and how do we gather, grow, give, and go? How do we do those four things? And as a family, at the beacon, we gather on Sundays uh, for worship and for celebrating the work of our Father during the rest of the week. But Sundays is not our identity. Sundays comes from our identity, but it is not our identity. Sunday does not define us. It's been interesting in this crisis that we have seen the American church wrestle with its identity. As Sunday was taken away from them, uh, then how do we do that? And yet the Chinese church hasn't had to wrestle with this. The persecuted church doesn't wrestle with this. The early church didn't wrestle with Sunday being their identity because they didn't have the opportunity for Sunday to even exist on their realm of things to do. So Sunday was not the thing. So because Sunday wasn't a, a deal, uh, they didn't, mistake Sunday morning as their identity. Nor is Sunday morning our mission. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could gather on Sunday mornings and sing hymns. Jesus died on the cross so that we would go and make disciples of all nations to establish the kingdom of God on this planet. So that's what he did. He didn't die for Sunday. So our mission then to make disciples is fulfilled as we go on a mission with our community together. Um, to make disciples of our friends and our neighbors. We're going to talk a little bit about this later. But each community then breaks up into smaller groups where we focus on making disciples. We grow in a DNA group. DNA stands for discipling, nurturing, and accountability as we each are being called into a deeper level of obedience in our walk with Jesus. And to be more like them, we walk together as we help each other to make that walk. So finally, in each of these areas, as servants, we give of our time, talent, and resources 
trying to be good, good stewards of what God has given us. Hopefully that makes sense as we kind of pull all of that together. And our logo actually reminds us of those four things. As we pull those four areas together, we use a, a series of colors and things like that um, to bring our, 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 uh, the identity into a graphic image. As a family, we gather, grow, give, and go together. So those four arrows that you see there also uh, radiating, out, radiating out from there remind us that, first of all, we're beacons of light. We're sent to shine the light of Jesus in the world. You see the, the lighthouse there, there. If you look at our logo, it kind of looks like the, a very close-up stylized lighthouse, and it's meant to look like that on purpose, although the arrows are in color, and again, they remind us of those four Gs. But the radiating arrows coming out from that lighthouse also remind us that we are sent as missionaries, and we are sent by the Holy Spirit to be servants in the name of Jesus. And this imagery that's here that you see is inspired by the ancient symbol of the Jerusalem or the missionary cross, where the disciples were sent to the four corners of the earth. Finally, though, I want to draw you back to, if you look back at our logo in this very center, there's a black circle in the very center. And that's probably, I think, the most profound element that's in there. The black circle reminds us that every family, every family gathers around a table for meals and fellowship. So what table does our family, the, the Beacon family, the family of God gather around? Our family gathers around actually four different tables. The first of those tables, we're invited to the heavenly banquet table and um, where we are invited to that place in heaven where Jesus, this is Jesus's favorite picture of heaven, is this heavenly feast, a, one, a wedding feast. That's a place of perfect peace and shalom and relationship with our Father and with others. And we are invited to that table, and our Father is the host. We are the guests, and he invites everyone to come to that table. But access to that table is available only through Jesus. And so Jesus's table, the Lord's table, is where Jesus is the host, and we are the guests. We're invited, and that's the communion table. And at the communion table, it reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice for us so that we can come to the Father's table in heaven. But it's through, it reminds us of the Father's table. Uh, it is a temporary place setter for that table, uh, of, for that eternal place, that eternal feast that's coming. But the Lord's Supper is not the main event. It's a place setter for the main event, which is the heavenly banquet table. It also defines us as the people of God. It defines us as the body of Christ. It defines us as those that are called out, ecclesia, that are called out together from the world. Why are we called? We're called out, and this is the last thing it reminds us out. We have work to do. We still have things to finish as we go out as the hands and feet of Jesus. So that work happens around, and this is the third table, our tables. This is Jesus set a, an example for us of how to do the mission in his, his table, that we, are, we get to be the hosts as we follow Jesus' model of hospitality and use our gifts and our blessings to invite others to experience a taste of the heavenly banquet table that is to come that will be eternity. But there are people who cannot or will not come to our tables. So like Simon the leper or Matthew the tax collector, they get to be the hosts. We get to be the guests, but we also bring the taste of heaven with us. We get to bring a taste of the kingdom as we come. So you'll see that these three tables all point to that heavenly banquet table in the future. Our mission as we go radiates from our identity radiates from these four tables. And our logo is meant to remind us of our identity and as our mission. And again, I know that I go over this a lot, but I go because people forget. If I asked probably half of us what each of the colors meant, what the direction meant, what our identity is, a lot of us wouldn't know. So I want to come back to this and remind us again and again, because when you get in those situations where you're trying to explain it to someone, repetition is your, your best friend in the midst of it. So forgive me if I'm being repetitious, but the repetition, the colors, the icons, all of this is meant to help you remember kind of what we're trying to accomplish. And every year we pick a verse to guide us on our mission and our theme verse for 2020 and 2021, hopefully mostly 2021 because I'm done with 2020, comes from John chapter 10, verse 10. That says, I came that they may have life and have that abundantly. So you can go ahead and circle life 
and circle abundantly. I highlighted it on the screen for you, but hopefully you can, as you see it, you'll be able to um, uh, highlight those two words because we believe that God is not intended for us to live out our lives and drudgery and, and just making it through, waiting for that uh, sweet by and by, that heavenly banquet feast. He also wants us in this life now to live full, joyful, abundant, meaningful lives uh, that, that, are, that are exactly the kind of lives that you would hope for. You're not just waiting for a good life. This can be the good life. This can be the abundant life. And from the abundance that you live in this life, we can accomplish God's mission for us. So if you don't find that abundance, you can't fully lean into the mission that God has called you to. So this year, we're going to be focusing on the abundant life that God calls us to. Um, the, uh, we're going to focus on that, and we're learning this uh, through the month of September. We're taking that from the I am statements of Jesus. The first I am statement that we studied uh, a couple of weeks ago came from John chapter 10. Uh, this is where our annual verse came from, actually. And, and it's talking about the idea, the context of the abundant life. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he goes on and says that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And from this, we learn that one of the keys to the abundant life is a life of sacrifice and giving ourselves away, giving away, although it's totally, uh, um, it's, it, it's not intuitive that the way to an abundant life is to give things away. And yet that's the life that God has called us to. This is the, the life of sacrifice that God calls us to. It's only when we let go that we actually can receive the, the abundance that God calls us to. So disciples sacrificially give themselves away. So last week, we studied that uh, Jesus' statement, the I am statement, where Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, where Jesus tells us that the abundance that, that, the, that he wants for us comes when we, and verse 4 says, abide in him and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide, when we study this, is the idea of acting in accordance with. When our lifestyle, and this is a lifestyle word, abiding is, is about the way we live in general. It's not, the, the, it's not just a one-time thing. It's, a, it's about the general lifestyle that we live. Our lifestyle is in accordance with the teachings of Jesus. And when we abide, that is when we begin to grow and be more like Jesus and we bear fruit in our lives that reflects that we are his followers. This week, the uh, lesson on abundant living comes from John chapter 8, where Jesus, uh, it, he just is in a situation where he has brought this woman who's caught in adultery, and you know how that whole situation goes. We'll talk about that later. And his very next statement out of his mouth, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I don't think many people will disagree with the idea that Jesus is at least a good teacher. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are around the world. A lot of people would say that Jesus is a good teacher. Um, they would agree then he probably is a historical light that's out there. But Jesus is not making an argument to claim that he is merely another good teacher on earth. He is setting himself apart as something completely different, something else, above and apart from everything else. You notice that definitive article there, the? He says, I am the light of the world. Everything else is darkness, but he is the light of the world. So abundance comes in the light, not in the darkness. That's where the abundant life comes from, living in the light that comes from Jesus. And you can't just be in the light. It's a lifestyle. The verse continues. It says, whoever follows me, follows is an ongoing lifestyle word. Whoever follows me will not walk. Walk is also an ongoing lifestyle word. Will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. The goal is to have the light of life. That's where the abundance comes from. Follow and walk again are verbs. They're ongoing verbs. They're lifestyle verbs. Um, to, so to benefit from the abundance of his light, you have to follow him, not just today, not just for a moment, not just in your good moments, not just on a Sunday, but as a lifestyle. And walking 
not in the darkness, but we walk in the light. It is a choice that we make of where we're going to walk and how we're going to walk, but it is also a choice, and this is the part that I love, it's also a choice of who we walk with. You know the saying that says, birds of a feather flock together. People choose who they hang out with, either because those are people who are like them or it's people they want to be like. And so birds of a feather flock together. You have to choose to walk in the light with others who also walk in, a, in the light. And if you choose to live a lifestyle with those who are in darkness, you're going to experience the lifestyle that they have chosen. It's going to be full of darkness, and the result will be darkness in your own life. Now, this is the thing to be careful of, because what the automatic thing would be to do is that means that we totally isolate and separate ourselves from, from darkness. And Jesus said, I want that you should be uh, wise as serpents, but innocent as doves, right? We're supposed, he's left us in this world on purpose, not to isolate from the world, but to live in this world. So it doesn't mean that we don't fraternize with the world, that we don't participate with those that are living out in darkness, because that's what Jesus got, got um, uh, people were attacking Jesus for, that he was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and things like that, right? So it's not that we don't hang out with those kinds of people. In fact, the exact opposite is true, because if your lifestyle is surrounded by others who are also living a lifestyle in the light, it gives you the power and the strength and the energy to go out into the world, get this, together. So we go together because together we are stronger as we go out together. And that's where we get to make the most impact when we go together. You can go alone. It's just not going to be as effective. You're more effective when you go together. Here's where it gets interesting. Jesus not only said that he was the light of the world, he said something very stunning, actually, in the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. I'll give you a second there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did you? He, it, it, it's, it, it's easy to see Jesus as being the light of the world, because of course he is. Everything he did, he was God on earth, all of those things. He was, he was amazing. He is the light on the earth. And yet he says that you, and I'm pointing to you on the screen right now, are the light of the world. Turn to the person next to you or across the room or wherever and say, you are the light of the world. I'm waiting. If we follow Jesus, by definition, we too become lights of the world. Folks, that's a mind-blowing statement. We get to be not just lights, but we get to be the light of the world. But there's something more, something more, and this is the exciting part. It says, we will be a city on a hill that can't be hidden. A city is not just a single solitary light. Honestly, if you see a light, a city with just one light on in the midst of it, that's pretty depressing. That means they've got a problem. It, that means that they've got, you know, state of California power outages, roll, rolling blackouts, whatever. There's problems going on if you've got a city that's only got one light shining in the midst of the darkness. He's saying that we're a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. That means all of our lights are shining. That means we are called to be a community of light. A city is not just one light, but it is a collection, a community of lights together. As we gather together, one light is very effective in the darkness. That's the amazing thing about light. You just take one candle, one match, and you light it in a pitch dark room, and you'll get to see things all around the room. You can see it. We used to meet in the cafeteria at El Medina. If you took one candle and lit it in that pitch dark room, you could see all the corners. You could see that one little tiny light can do that. One little match, one little candle in the dark it will chase, by definition, it chases the darkness away. But the more candles you have in the room, the brighter, the more brilliant, the more powerful. And there's this exponential gathering of light that chases away the darkness. The power of darkness disappears. It has no way. Darkness actually isn't anything. It has no power. It is the lack of everything. And it's just a nothingness, whereas light is actually a presence. And that is the way we're supposed to go with our communities on mission together. We're going as a collection of lights out into community. And so we really try at the beacon not to have all beacon strategic missional initiatives together. What we try to do is have each of our communities have initiatives that they do together so that you as a community can go 
on mission together. Now the beacon's small, so we can do, we do have some initial uh, strategic initiatives that we do together in the community. Part of that is with the homeless, part of that is with the, the tree lighting, and we have a couple other activities that we do. And you've seen how such a small gathering of people can make a huge, we've gotten uh, awards from the state of California for the things that we've been able to participate. I got a, I, guess what? I got a call two days ago from the deputy, um, I forget the title, uh, the guy that the, uh, does the per prosecutor, this, the prosecutor for Orange County wants to meet with us about what we've been doing with the homeless in, in the city of Orange. They want to meet with, with us. Um, that's because we've taken our few little lights and bound them together. and We've had an exponential impact together. That's what going on mission together as the lights of the world can do, it can make an impact where the world pays attention. That's what we're called to do. And that's what we try to focus you together in your community so your mission, your community can be in your neighborhood. Because look where we are. We're scattered all over this planet. Bahrain, Nevada, Germany, we've got people all over the place. And so for us to focus on the city of Orange would be counterintuitive. It would be counterproductive. We'd be putting all of our energy in a place where not a lot of us can actually spend our energy. And yet God has individually placed us in different communities in Irvine and Costa Mesa and Santa Ana and Garden Grove. By the way, we were supposed to have a couple online today that's starting our new Santa Ana community. We're in downtown Santa Ana. They're working with, with down there. Um, Evan and Stephanie, you're going to meet them. I'd hoped you'd meet them today, but you're, you're going to meet them today. It's a different community. So if we just said, no, 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 we're just about orange, we'd be eliminating a lot of great things that God wants to do and, and to partner with us uh, on. So God has called us to our neighborhoods, to our regions, to our cities, so that we can make an impact together. And we do that through our missional communities. Missional communities are usually focused on either a people or a place. If it's a people, you could say that your missional community is focused on homeless people. It could be focused on single moms. It could be, be focused on a soccer team. It could be focused on an equestrian community, which by the way, we're working on that as well. Or it could be focused on a place. You're, in, you know, just write down, fill in your street address. It's your, that place is your house, your neighborhood, that couple square blocks around where you live. The point is that you are a missionary. Turn again, turn to the point the person next to you. You are a missionary. The person next to you is a missionary. You are a missionary. The mission is, your mission is, your mission field is where God put you. If he put you in the midst of a, a, a bunch of artists, then maybe your missional community, maybe your mission is among artists. If God has put you in the midst of low-income families, then maybe your mission is low-income families. If, and I know that God has put you in a neighborhood somewhere because every one of us has a place to live. God has put you, even Leroy, Leroy is living in a hotel in Huntington Beach. Leroy, your mission field is that hotel. Those are the people that God has put you with. That's where he is. And the easiest way to figure out what your mission field is, is to look at around at your, here's a word, oikos. O-I-K-O-S. We've talked about this a lot. Again, we're fixing leaks. We're plugging leaks. Remember what oikos is? Oikos is the Greek word that says for your house or your household. It's the word where we get the word economy. So in the ancient world, your household was not just the physical people that were part of your family. It was also those people that you employed, those people that were part of your, uh, your leadership. They depended on your leadership. And uh, for example, if you think of, uh, about the TV show Downton Abbey, um, the uh, economy, the oikos of Downton Abbey and the Lord of uh, Downton Abbey was not just the family, nor was it just the servants that worked in the house. There was a whole village that depended on the economy that came from the Lord and his estates. That would be his oikos. He has a very large oikos. He has a whole village that was a part of his oikos. So everyone that fits within your economy. Now, each of us have an oikos. We probably don't have estates. I don't know any of us that have estates or uh, the miners are living on a ranch out there. So there's lots of people that are on the ranch. There's people that come work there. There's people that have horses that are on that ranch. They're all a part of the oikos that is that ranch. But each of us has a household that, like I said, is in a literal neighborhood. 
And that household that you have, that you, the oikos that you are over, includes those in your literal household, but it also includes those that are your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, the people that you work out with the gym, the, uh, the clerk at the checkout stand at the grocery store that you go to, the postman that comes to your door every day, if, you, if you're intentional with those relationships, those people can become part of your oikos. The point is you have to be intentional with who those are. You need to pray for those people. You need to pray about how, who God wants you to spend. Because honestly, you, you and I, if you, if you went through the oikos activity, I'm going to put this in the bulletin this next week so you can download it, so you can go through and think and pray through your oikos. If you go through that, you're going to find easily 30, 40, 50, some of you 60, 70 people in your oikos. And there's no way that any of us, Jesus couldn't do it. Jesus had 12 or 13 that was in his immediate little oikos. Um, so there's no way any of us could do that. So you need to limit the people who you're going to spend time with and to be, here's the word, be intentional with. So when you're being intentional with those people, it doesn't mean you're being intentional about handing them a gospel track. It means that you're being intentional with engaging them with life. You ask them out to dinner. You go over and drop a little, little bouquet of flowers on their table because you know they're having a celebration or you know that one of them's having a birthday or you know that they suffered a loss in their family or you take them a, a bowl of soup or a, a, a pot full of soup because you know that uh, you know that they're sick or something like that when and when you get the opportunity when you're intentional with you you begin asking questions and curiosity about how their life is i'll tell you john abbas is the number one person that i know about asking questions that boy knows how to ask questions i didn't even know existed he can be in a conversation and it's actually hard to have a conversation with him because he's always asking the questions if you want to know about John, you have to be proactive and to ask, to beat him to the punchline and ask the questions. But when you're asking the questions, it's not just asking the questions, it's listening to their story, listening to where their story and the gospel can engage each other. It's, it's by inviting them to come to your table when this whole COVID thing is over. It's about going to the beach or to the park together. Guess what, folks? The parks have just taken down all the police tape off the playground, so you can play in the playgrounds now. So your kids can play and the adults can talk while they're doing it. Uh, the parks are open. But as we do life with people, this is where discipleship begins. Because as you have conversations with, with people, as you're just doing life discipleship, they begin to be influenced by the light that is in your life. And sometimes it means they stop smoking cigarettes just because you make them feel like it's a thing that they ought to do. Not because you're convicting them of it, but because, you know what? I want to be like you, and you don't smoke cigarettes, or you don't cuss. That's the kind of person I want to be. Or guess what? I'm going to, we're going to be intentional, and we're going to have dinner time with our kids because I saw you do that, and I think that's really a good idea. That's just life discipleship. That's not, that just comes out of conversations. It's not sitting down in a Bible study and how to stop smoking cigarettes. It's not a Bible study on how to stop cussing or how to have family times around the table. It's just living life together. And when they see the beauty and the light coming from your life, it inspires them, and they want to become like that. Carolyn used to have a friend that, that she started going to church just because they started baking cookies together. And in the conversation, this lady realized, hey, my family needs to go to church. And so they started going to church. This is what it means to be life, that we don't hide the light that is within us, that we just let it shine, just let it be natural. It's not about memorizing a spiritual you know, evangelism program. or anything. It's just letting the light of Jesus shine through the beauty of the life, that, the abundance. How's that? About through the abundance of the life that God has given you. The verse continues in verse 15 in Matthew 5. Nor do people hide the light, nor people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. Uh, in, in the house. Lights, the, a light's purpose is to shine, not to be hidden. It's to shine. So just let it shine. Just let your, the gospel shine in your life. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When we do life with people, they, they get to see the real us. If we're doing it right, in seeing the real us, they're going to experience a taste of that heavenly banquet table. They're going to experience joy. They're going to experience hope. They're going to experience peace, 
just by being in your presence and doing life with them. They're going to experience a little bit of what it's going to be like at the father's table. And that's going to be attractive to them. And eventually they're going to want to know where that peace and that joy and that hope comes from. And that's where life discipleship transitions to strategic discipleship. And you invite someone in and say, hey, can we just sit down and be strategic and have some conversations about this? And let me show you what the Bible says about some of these things. And that's where your DNA group comes in place. That's where you're, you sit down together and you study scripture. DNA groups are smaller groups of men and women from within your community who gather to go deeper in their, their desire to be obedient to Jesus. We learn the teachings of Jesus through studying God's word. And then we hold each other accountable to that. We hold each other like, so the question, I, I have two DNA groups, and at the very last thing we ask each other, and those of you that are in those groups, you know, the very last question when we start, okay, so what is, what is the obedience that God's asking you to live in this week? Sometimes it's, it's just the living into the truths of God's word. Sometimes it's just trusting what God says. Sometimes it is something like, ah, I'm not going to cuss anymore. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, smoke cigarettes. Sometimes it is those kinds of things, but sometimes it's, it's, it's a little more fine-tuned. So now we get to that place in our conversation, our Sunday morning conversation, where I get to ask you, now what? What is the obedience that God is calling you to live into today? So the keys to the abundant life that we've been talking about so far is that uh, we are to sacrificially give ourselves away, that we are to grow in Jesus. That's what we talked about last week. And this week we talked about going with others on mission together and shine for Jesus. So how is God asking you this week to live into obedience? Well, the first question I would ask you is, who's in your Oikos? Use the Oikos map that, that I'm going to put on the email so that you can think through the people in your community and, and just ask the Lord and be praying for them. Put it up. I have a little one that, that I sit that's next to my computer all week long. And it's just who is within my Oikos that God wants me to be intentional about this week. The second thing is, um, are you in a community? And if you're not, this is the week that we have strategic set aside for several things. One of them is, if you're not in a community, join one. And if you are in a community, we're going to ask you, so, so first of all, if you're not in a community, you may not, you know, be, things may not work with your community. You need to find a new one. Guess what? No harm, no foul. You can hop around. You can go try out a new community if you want. We've got uh, communities in Irvine, uh, Costa Mesa, or Irvine North, Irvine South, Costa Mesa Coastal, we got the one here in North Tustin. We have another one, again, the new one in downtown Santa Ana. We have the cowboy one that I've been meeting with lately about how we're going to start that one. It hasn't actually started, but we're, we're getting closer. We have East Orange. Uh, there may be a couple others that we need to start as well. Some of those communities are in mission to their neighbors. Some of them are in communities and to a specific target. Our community is, uh, is trying to focus now on trying to reach the Cub Scout families. We just had this last week, six different Cub Scout families in our front yard, and they're hanging out where their kids are with Jeff and with the team. And we're having conversations with them. We're just trying to build relationships with them. But go communities. If you're in a go community, this is, week, what, this is what I'd like you to do, either virtually or in person this week. Will you gather, and I'd like you to pray. This is our prayer week. Monday through next Saturday, this is our prayer week, and we're praying about the mission that God has your community called uh, on this next week. We're also praying for the ministry of the Beacon as we reach out into all the various places that we're be reaching out uh, in this next year. Now, obviously, things are going to be weird this next week. We're trying to, like uh, Raina tried to said, we don't have all the answers about how next week is going to happen, so you're going to need to read your bulletin about how next week comes together. But Pray about your, your mission, what your community is on mission together. What is the mission that you're going to do with your community? How are you going to go and be light and shine? Not just light, but shine as the light of the world. How are you going to accomplish that? What are the strategic things you're going to do to be the light where God has called you? How will you shine your light into the world? And where are you going to shine, uh, go as you shine? So next, next week, we'll gather for our Ohana family celebration. And then guess what? We are going to do this in two different ways. We're going to have the morning Zoom call for those of you that are not comfortable gathering. It'll be the same call that you, you see. And for those of you that are comfortable and really would like to gather, we're going to gather over. Right now it's at Taft Avenue. That may not be the final answer, but we're going to, there will be a 10 o'clock in the morning opportunity and there will also be the evening opportunity for you to gather. And we're going to talk about the future together and uh, celebrate what it means to be a family. We'll have a video of this last year of ministry. Yes, it's continued. And so I'll have a video highlights of, of how that's happened and stuff like that. 
But what is the obedience that God is calling you today in terms of specifically what it means for you to go on mission with other people to be the light of the world? <clears throat>